supporters, oh, the Kamalobi oh, County, Ross Collins Alumni Club, UNCF Banquet and Choir Concert. Uh, we know that you're going to have a wonderful time with the experience that we have put in place for you all tonight. So again, I want to say thank you all for coming. Thank you for your support. And I want to thank you for your continued support. So at this time, we're going to ask our head table to come forward. We have with our head table, Mr. Jerry Smith, Dr. Jeffrey Gladden. We have our speaker, Reverend Dr. Kevin Cosby. We have our mistress of ceremony for tonight, Ms. Beverly Johnson. We have Dr. Stevie McKinney, and our illustrious president of Russ College, Dr. Ivy R. Taylor. We have Ms. Agnew, Angelique Agnew Bean. stranger to Western Mississippi, Tennessee. She has done tremendous work in the radio and announcement area. Our mistress of ceremony was born Beverly Elaine Johnson in Memphis, Tennessee. She was born to the parents of the late William Van Johnson and Julia Atlas Dana Johnson. She is a 1970 graduate of Ann Arbor Pioneer High School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Belle received her Bachelor of Arts degree from, from Rutgers College in English Literature in 1975 and received a Master of Science degree in Educational Media Technology in 1979 from Jackson State University. In 2003, she received certification, a certification degree in substance abuse counseling from Southwest Tennessee Community College, as well as certification in drug court counseling from the Drug Court Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Their uh, broadcasting journey began in 1976 at WJSU Radio which eventually led her to WOKJ and WJMI and WKKI radio stations in Jackson, Mississippi, where she worked as a disc jockey, program and assistant, public affairs director, and news director. And in 1981, Gurney continued to Memphis, Tennessee, where she worked at WLOK along with a number of others. And then she ended up at the legendary WDIA radio, where she's been employed for a number of years. She is a community-oriented person who is a former board member of the Rock and Soul Museum, Memphis Area Planned Parenthood, the National Black Programmers Coalition, and Memphis City Beautiful. Beverly has mentored students for a number of years for the board and elementary school girls program. And she served as the chairperson for the NAACP's annual radio fund. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and a charter member 
of the Shelby County Alumni Chapter of Degma, Delta Sigma Theta. Bev Johnson has received numerous awards and honors to include the UNCF Outstanding Alumnus Award, the National Association of Broadcasters Marconi Award. She was honored by the Tennessee General Assembly, the House of Representatives, also the Memphis City Council, Shelby County Commission, and the U.S. House of Representatives for her outstanding work with the Bev Johnson Show. In 1924, Bev was inducted into the History Makers Media Division of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. She is a real trailblazer who in 2019 was inducted into the Tennessee Radio Hall of Fame and in 2020 was awarded the Trailblazer Award from the city of Memphis Heritage Trail. Our Ministry of Ceremony is a woman of God. She is a counselor, college instructor, motivational speaker, and she is a jewel in her profession. Audience, I would like for you to please welcome my schoolmate and friend, Miss Beverly Bell Johnson. Thank you, Brother Clarence. I'm going to do this for a moment. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Brother Clarence. As I grow older, as I grow older, as I grow older, I pay less attention to what men and women say. I just watch what they do. It is indeed a pleasure, a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. And I have to confess, Brother Clans, I got lost. <laughs> Coming and going, but I'm here. I'm here. I'm here with y'all. It is, again, a deep pleasure to be here at the Tupelo Lee County Rust. College Alumni Club, UNCF Banquet. Right. And I remember many of those as a student at Rust College and as a member of the acapella choir, right. the world famous Rust College acapella choir. Right. It is so nice to see the president Dr. Taylor. I've talked with her. I've interviewed her on the telephone. And since the pandemic, I hadn't seen my, my soul up. Nice meeting you. Good to be here. Well, we'll get on with the program. At this time, we will have greetings from Councilwoman Tupelo Ward, Mrs. Nettie Davis. Alumni Association, to all of the Russ College alumnus, 
and all went to a HBCU school, a UNCF school. Greetings to you tonight. It, I, I am very elated and excited about being asked to greet you tonight. This is a very historical event and one that you will never forget. As I was coming up in the community, and many of you were coming up in the community, one of the main schools that lay embedded their name in the city of Tupelo and Lee County was Russ College. Most of our teachers at George Washington Carver and all of the other schools in Lee County attended Russ College. They were outstanding educators in the community, outstanding religious leaders, outstanding leaders and mentors. I can remember when I was in the fourth grade, my teacher is Marin Cray, who was a graduate of Russ College, was my mentor. She was very outstanding in art, and she made all type of impressions on me and other students. As a result, I ended up going to a UNCF school that's a sister to Russ College, Bennett College, and received my degree in art. Many of the things that were going on in the community before uh, we integrated a part of the United Methodist Church, people participated in activities at, at Russ College, seminars, uh, workshops, all type, type of religious experiences. So Russ College was one of our outstanding institutions that made a big impact on this community along with some of the other schools that were in the uh, Mississippi area. The city of Tupelo always gives support to education institutions. And I wish you much luck in your endeavor tonight to carry on the legacy of Russ College in this community. We still have students who attend Russ College from this area and hope we can continue to give support to one of our schools that we claim in North Mississippi. So I wish you Luck tonight on your event and hope that you will have many more where we can give support to our school that we cherish so much. Thank you so much. Davis, thank you so very much. And, and saying that, and many of us here graduated from UNCF, and I love the theme tonight, sustaining educational excellence in a pandemic era. What two years we have had. Oh my Lord, but thank God we still here. We still here. Thank God, we are still here. At this time, you know, they say that music soothes the savage beast. Well, we're gonna get ready to hear some music to soothe our souls, to calm us down. Before that, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm rushing, I'm rushing, I want to hear music. I'm rushing, I'm rushing. We will have greetings, I'm rushing, y'all. 
I want to hear some music. <laughs> From the Tupelo Lee County Rust College Alumni Club, the secretary, please welcome Mrs. Angelique Agnew B. Sunday. If you wasn't there, 
If you didn't go home on the weekends, you were in chapel on Sundays at Russ College. Then the gatherings of friends on campus outside the red, hearing the fraternities and the sororities shoot their signs and their callings. Um, Russ College stood proud on that hill. Uh, looking back, I often think about the long road from Baldwin to Holly Springs that I made. And you all, I'm going to be honest, I was upset to know that I was getting ready to go to Russ College. I thought, I'm leaving Northeast Community College and I'm going to Russ College. I had never ate a polar sausage and corn until I got to Russ College. <laughs> there were no two or three lines in there. There was one line. You didn't get two or three happens. You ate what was on your plate, the corn, the roll, the smoked sausage, and whatever you got to drink. But as I continued my three years at Russ College, I can remember all of May of 1995. I walked across, not May, but April of 1995, as I walked across that stage, and I earned my diploma, and I thought about all the good times that I had at Russ College. As I began to leave the campus on April of 1995, I looked back as tears dropped from my eyes, and I thought about dear Russ College, well done, well done. You have created a leader. And that's the bond that people that went to Russ College have all over the world. And if you know of this bond, you will agree with me that Russ College was the place to be. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you, Sora. <laughs> I'm listening to her tell the stories of Russ College, and I think about when my mother said, thinking about schools to go to, well, my, my first ambition was to go to the American Academy of, of Dramatic Arts, and, and President Taylor received a full ride scholarship. Back in those days, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City, they didn't have a dormitory. And my dad told me, you think you're going to New York at 17 and I gotta find you somewhere to stay? You better find you a place with a dormitory. So my mother said, well, why not Russ Collins? I said, uh-uh, they lynch black folks in Mississippi. <laughs> but when I, Got to Russ College, she took me there. Mr. Raper told my mother, Mr. Raper, he said, we're gonna take care of her. And Russ College took care of me. Now, we can have some music. From the former Russ College choir members, Please give them a whole lot of rust common blood.
gives me strength from day. and grace from the pastor of People Community Baptist Church, the Reverend Dr. Stevie D. McKinney. Well, let's pray. Eternal God, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this blessed moment in time. Eternal God, we ask that you continue to open up our hearts and our minds that 
we may continue to receive thy word. We thank you for Russ College. We thank you for what Russ College has stood for over the years. We thank you for our president, for our faculty, for our staff, and for those who pray daily and nightly for Russ College. Eternal God, we pray that you would just continue to keep your hands up over Russ. And not only Russ College, Father God, but every HBCU across this beautiful land and country. We thank you for our education. We thank you for leading us. We didn't know which way to go. Oh, Father God, you've been so good to us. Down through the years, you've been good to us. And we pause tonight just to say thank you. Not for what you might do on tomorrow, but we're saying thank you for the blessings that we have already received. Oh, eternal God, for you have been back to us than we have been to ourselves. As my grandmother used to say, if I had 10,000 hands, I could not wait on you. If I had 10,000 tongues, I couldn't thank you enough. We say thank you tonight. We thank you for this program. And we pray that nothing will be said or done in vain. But we'll pray that thy will be done. And eternal God, we also thank you for the food. We thank you for the hands you have taken time to prepare. We pray that we strengthen our bodies and nurture our souls. As we continue to strive to do thy will. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Let the people of God together say amen. 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 have the pleasure of introducing the person who will introduce our speaker. Please welcome the pastor of Red Oak Baptist Church, Tupelo, Mississippi, the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey A. Gladman. Say loud across the room. For more than 40 years, Dr. Kevin W. Cosby has served as a senior pastor of St. Stephen's Baptist Church, the largest African American church in the state of Kentucky, as well as the largest private black employer of African Americans in the state. In 2005, Dr. Cosby was inaugurated as the 13th president of Simmons College of Kentucky in 2007. He led the once fledgling college to reclaim its original campus lost during the Great Depression and has since expanded uh, to three campuses location. Under Dr. Cosby's visionary leadership, the college earned national accreditation from the Association of Biblical Higher Education, ABHE, and expanded its degree program. Dr. Cosby uncovered the rich history of Simmons, which was established by former slaves, and in 2014, Simmons was recognized by the U.S. Department of Education as a historical black college and university. That deserves a hand right there. During his first decade there, Dr. Cosby refused to take a salary to stabilize the college Amen, and returned more than $700,000. He is one of our nation's most influential leaders and best preacher pastor teachers. He was inducted to the gallery of great black Kentuckians and the Kentucky, at the Kentucky State Capitol in 2015. At the request of Muhammad Ali, he served as one of the eulogists at his funeral in 2016 and he was inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers of Morehouse College in 2017. Dr. Cosby has released several books. Uh, he released a new book in the spring of 2021 entitled Getting to the Promised Land, Black Americans and the Unfinished Work of the Civil Rights Movement. The book is a biblical commentary on the American descendants of slaves, ADOS, and is published by Westminster John Knox Press. Dr. Cosby has an earned doctorate of ministry degree and is pursuing his second doctorate, a PhD. Dr. Cosby is married to the former Barnett Turner, 
They have two adult children, Krista Nicole and Kevin Christopher. I introduce the song and I present to others our most illustrious speaker for this occasion, Dr. Kevin Cosby. And give him a round of applause. Thank you, sir, for extending to me this wonderful privilege and honor. I am humbled to have been asked to make a contribution to this beloved historic institution and to do whatever I can do to help celebrate and to advance the cause of historical black colleges and universities. Thank you, sir, for this signature honor to our very celebrated mistress of ceremony, Ms. Beverly Johnson, to the esteemed president of this hallowed institution, Dr. Ivy R. Taylor, to those who constitute the dais, to you, my brothers and my sisters, in the work of the kingdom of God. Thank you so very much for inviting me to come and to share. I wish my wife were here to see this. She would be hippopotamus happy and elephant elated <laughs> to see what, what you are doing. And um, it is the right thing to do. One day we're going to wake up and realize that we are all we got. And our strength is predicated on whether or not we will turn to each other or whether we will turn on each other. Strength comes, we're stronger together. And our strength emanates always from us turning on each other, or turning to each other, excuse me. That's, uh, I have uh, been the pastor of St. Stephen Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky for, I'm in my 43rd year. And uh, when my wife and I went there, we were five years old. <laughs> But uh, my wife and I, when we got married, decided and made a plan to each other that we would always turn to each other and never find each other. So in 43 years of being married to Barnett, we have never gone to bed in 43 years. We've never gone to sleep angry with each other. There was a time when we didn't go to sleep for six months. <laughs> but we've done our best to try to turn to each other. Turn to each other and on each other. I told her, I said, girl, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. <laughs> well, I know what you're wondering. You're wondering, well, how long is he going to be? Because I'm competing with your appetite. And I know it. One uh, preacher was up and he was looking at his watch like this and one of the boys in the congregation looked at his father and he said, Dad, he keeps looking at his watch. What does that mean? And the father looked at his son and said, well, it all depends. If he's a priest and he's looking at his watch, that means he's got five minutes left. <clears throat> If he's an Episcopalian or a Presbyterian and he's looking at his watch, that means he's going to stop on time at 12 noon sharp. That's right. But if it's a Baptist preacher, <laughs> he is looking at his watch. It don't mean nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a 
don't wrap this boot tonight. But I will do my best to try to act, if not like a priest, at least like an Episcopalian on this particular time. I want to read a scripture to you that has become one of my favorite scriptures because it has a metaphor and analogy that I hope that you will never forget. You should never forget it because it may be the last uh, parable, if you will, analogy, metaphor, that Jesus used. And it's a powerful metaphor for all Christians, and especially for a group of people in our community that W.E.B. Du Bois called the talent 10th, the gifted, professional, exceptional people that W.E.B. Du Bois challenged to use your giftedness in the service of the race, what's called being a race man or a race woman using your strength for those who are weak. The strength of the strong made available for the weakness of the weak, using your strength to help lift the weak. Because if the strength of the strong is not made available for the weak, then the weakness of the weak will cross the fence and undermine the strength of the strong. If we're on an airplane 30,000 feet in the air, I'm in first class and you're in coach. I have room, you have limited room. I have a meal, you have half a Coke and peanuts. <laughs> but if we're 30,000 feet in the air and the pilot said there is engine problem in coach, I cannot say in first class that doesn't affect me. Because if coach goes down, first class goes down. Because we are all interconnected, as Martin Luther King said. Amen. So here's the scripture. John chapter 12 and verse 20, 20 through 25. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with the request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. King James says, sir, we would see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now here's the little prayer. Verily, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The lure of the PWI that's what I want to talk about. For those of you who do not know what a PWI is, it's a predominantly white institution. You have HBCUs, historical black colleges and universities. You have PWIs, predominantly white institution. And I want to talk to you about the lure of the P. W.I.s, because this is what this story in John's Gospel is really all about. Now this is um, the last week in the life of Jesus. Uh, it's his last week. 
because political operatives are seeking to snuff out his life because of policies that Jesus has implemented. Never say that Jesus died. That doesn't capture it. You would never say Mega ever died. You would never say Emmett Till died. You would say Emmett Till was lynched. You would say Mega Evers was murdered. Jesus was lynched. The theologian James Cone has written a book called Jesus and the Lynching Tree. And he argues that Jesus was lynched for political reasons. His death was a political assassination. In fact, when you read this 12th chapter of the Gospel of John, there's a political leader named Caiaphas. Caiaphas says, it is expedient that one man should die that a nation shall come down. They were playing high stakes politics. And the question is, what was it that the system saw threatening, felt was threatening about the politics of Jesus? It was a word Jesus kept using. This is the word that got Jesus in trouble. One word. Here it is. Whosoever. Whosoever. We, we, we recite John 3.16, but we don't really see how politically revolutionary John 3.16 is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that word whosoever is found interwoven throughout John's gospel. When he spoke with that woman at the well. He said to that woman at the well, he said to her, but whosoever drinks of the water I give shall never turn. <clears throat> whosoever. And when he comforted Mary and Martha, after the death of their brother Lazarus, after he had been dead and buried for four days, Jesus shows up there in that little village two miles outside Jerusalem. And he makes a disclosure, an identity disclosure. He says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And who soever there is liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Jesus was attempting to create, this is what got him in trouble, a whosoever society. And we do not live and have never lived in this country in a whosoever society. What, what determines academic success? What determines your longevity? Uh, what determines um, your wealth positionality? Is not, hear me, your genetic code. Your genetic code does not determine how long you live. Here it is. Your zip code. Your zip code is a greater indicator on your quality of life than your genetic code. And that is because we have organized society around hierarchy hegemony and elitism and what chimney the stork drops you down 
determines your quality. Just the chip. So in a world of, of elitism, hegemony, here comes Jesus with a revolutionary word, and he says, whosoever, whosoever. And I submit to you that we do not live in a whosoever world. We live in a world of elitism where certain people get privileges and others are denied. These Greeks come to Jesus. They come seeking Jesus. Uh, during the last year of Jesus' life, they approach one of Jesus' disciples. His name is Philip. He's from Bethsaida, which is right next to the Greek area of Palestine called the Decapolis. And he also has a Greek name. Philip is a Greek name. You remember Alexander the Great, his father is Philip of Macedon. There's a book in the New Testament right before Colossians, right after Ephesians called the Book of Philippians, named after Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon. These Greeks, and when it says Greek, it means native-born Greeks approach a man who is a disciple of Jesus with a Greek name by the name of Philip. And they say to Philip, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Now, it does not take much imagination for us to reconstruct what's going on in this story. Uh, based on Jesus' response, to their request for an interview, it's easy to see why these Greeks approach Jesus. They have approached Jesus because these Greeks are part of a pulpit search committee. <laughs> they are seeking to persuade Jesus to relocate back to Athens, PWI, because classical education, Eurocentric education, although we know its roots are in Africa, in Kemet, which we know is Egypt, but classical Greek uh, education emanates from Greece, from Athens. And these scholars, these academicians, are from Athens. And they have, they have come to Jerusalem and they are seeking audience with Jesus in hopes of persuading Jesus during the last week of his life to relocate, leave Palestine, leave Canaan, and come west to Athens and they have an attractive offer I mean after all it's a PWI and they've got an attractive offer let me tell you what they are offering Jesus if you'll let me just use my imagination that they're offering Jesus he's, he's 33 years old he's, he's 33 years old and they're offering Jesus a tenured professorship Tenured professorship. And then you gotta remember that Athens is a university town. They've got this great library. They've got great Colosseums. You think we've got Colosseums today? The Colosseums of the ancient world in Athens and Greece, those Colosseums, they have the great Colosseums, the great sports teams. Jesus uh, would be a part of a system, an educational system these PWIs that would be on ESPN. If he moves to Athens, Jesus will be granted academic freedom. Freedom he can't get where he is in Palestine among his own Jewish people. He'll be getting academic freedom, and no doubt um, he would be the next Socrates. Perhaps he would be Plato. He would be the next Aristotle. He would be the next Epimenes, he'd be the next Homer. 
If he moves to Athens, he'll be able to write books. He'll be able to participate in peer reviews, and conferences, and more important, if he takes them up on this offer to leave Palestine, to leave his own people, and go to the PWI, then he will avoid the crucifixion. Now let me ask you a question. Would you have taken the offer? Would you have taken the offer? The, the, the shadow of the cross is over. Nothing, nothing but the winds of opposition and antagonism is blowing in your face. And here come some recruiters from the preeminent university of the ancient world asking you to relocate. And by doing so, not only will you become popular and successful, but you will avoid the excruciation of the crucifixion. I once heard about a pastor who was always at second church, but he got called to first church. And his wife said, well, what are you going to do with that call? And he said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to go to my basement study, and I'm going to pray about it. But while I'm in the basement praying, you go upstairs and start packing. <laughs> what would you do if you are facing the cross and here comes the Greeks with an invitation to lure you away from your people and move to Athens where you could be successful and avoid suffering, avoid, avoid the struggle that comes with being a part of a marginalized and oppressed and wealthless group, what would you do? Well, it all depends on who you are. If you are career-oriented, you would you pack. If you're career-oriented. And there are a whole lot of black folk who are career oriented. Right. And a career oriented, can I preach? Yeah. A career oriented Negro <laughs> is a person who will do anything to personally advance their career because for the careerist, nothing is more important for the careerist than personally being successful. Right. And if you're a career-oriented person, well, you, you're going, you, you're gone with the Greeks. Right. But if you're a service-oriented person, yeah. 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 If, if, if you've got a servant mentality, oh, yeah. oh, then you, you, you might not leave. Right. And I would submit to you that what has hurt Black communities and black institutions is that we've got too many of our people who have been prey to the lure of the Greeks and the PWIs. See, Jesus was at an HBCU. Y'all think HBCU means historical black college university, but G he, HBCU means Hebrews Building Community United. Right? He was united with other Hebrews in a long succession of Hebrews from Abraham to Moses to Jeremiah to Amos. They were building Hebrews, building community united. And these Greeks were PWIs trying to lure him away from rust college in order that he might use his services uh, for the PWIs. 
And they probably used it in the name of progressivism. They probably said, you know what, Jesus is, if you come as a Hebrew and you come to Athens, then you'll help advance uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I've always had a problem with DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, because it's diversity into white space, equity into white space, and inclusion into white space. And that is why I've added two letters to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that's C and E, capitalization and empowerment. The capitalization of rust, which means resources, so that we get monetized instead of ghetto to eyes. We get the surplus instead of the sur minus. So capitalization and empowerment, which means control and decision making. That's right. And when you put those C and E to diversity, equity, and inclusion, it spells D ice. And what needs to take place is just like when I when you fly on a plane before it takes off, they de ice the wheels. Right. We need to de ice the resources yeah. so that HBCUs can have amen resources. And these Greeks no doubt say, oh, Jesus, if you come to Athens, you'll help advance diversity and equity and inclusion or integration. And the way integration has been conceptualized in these united hates of America <laughs> is that integration has always been a one-way integration. Where the best of blacks gets transferred into white space because it was based on the premise that black space is sick space and white space is healthy space. And therefore, since white space is healthy and black space is sick, then we've got to move black people away from black space and put them into white space where they are healthy and what that has done is that it has become a resource and brain drain Amen. on the black community so that we went from segregation to desegregation to integration to disintegration. As we are losing, amen, our institutions. Let me tell you what we should have done. We should have thought this thing through. When instead of segregation, desegregation, integration, disintegration, we should have gone from segregation to desegregation to reparations on diversity. Which is to say by reparations that if I work 246 years as slaves without a paycheck and another 100 plus years as a semi-slave and sharecropper and lynched and redlined and uh, put in prison with mass incarceration, then I'm not supposed to have any money. And that's why we can never have reconciliation in this country. If you steal my car on Monday, and you get saved on Tuesday, <laughs> and you still driving my car on Wednesday, oh. <laughs> you are not saved on Tuesday. <laughs> Can I Let me say this. If you steal my car on Monday, and you get saved on Tuesday, and you're still driving my car on Wednesday, you are not saved on Tuesday. Because the sign that you got saved on Tuesday is that you, listen to me, not only do you bring me my car back, but you bring it with gas, you bring it washed up, you bring it with new cars. Uh, you see, Malcolm X had this thing right. Malcolm X said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out three, that's not progress. He says, if you pull it out all the way, that's still not progress. Progress comes, watch this, when the wound is healed. And then he went on to say, and the problem is, is that you won't even admit that you put the knife in my back. And that is why you have in this state and across the country, these conservatives. Right. Who are pushing back against critical race theory, right. CRT, CRT, 
which is an abbreviation for Caucasians rejecting truth. <laughs> they will have you believe that you're down, that, you did, that we're poor, we only have 10 cents as people to their dollar because of our own lack of agency. That, that, that there's no structural uh, systemic disadvantages that are, that are baked into the system. But even Jesus talked about the seeds. He said, what determines what a seed will become is predicated on the soil. So if you take one seed and you put it in good soil, Jesus says, it's going to produce. If you take the same seed and you put it in bad soil, it will not produce. And we, and as a people, have always been given the bad soil. And we don't want to talk about that in this country because we say, well, we don't want our little kids to feel bad about our history. Can I ask you a question? When do you find in the Gospels that feeling bad is not good? When do you ever find that being convicted is a bad thing? Hear me. No grief, no growth. If you don't mourn, you don't mature. The only time we mature is because something is causing us to mourn. If you, if you, if you get healed from alcohol, you cannot mature until you mourn over the disease. Yeah. You cannot grow unless you grieve over something. That's how you grow. And the reason why some of us don't grow is because we won't grieve. And we won't grieve because we have enablers who become impediments to what the Greeks call metanoia yeah. or repentance. We don't have the buildings we have and the wealth we have because black people's wealth has been plundered. It's been maldistributed for centuries. Well, uh, black colleges like Simmons, Russ, other HBCUs for the most part have to be tuition driven. White institutions are endowment driven, are wealth driven. Which means if the student enrollment goes down in our schools, it affects everything. We have to lay people off. Right. Then one person has to do two or three jobs. Uh, when it comes to PWIs, if their tuition or their student enrollment is down, then their wealth kicks in. Their endowment kicks in. And then on top of that advantage they have, then they send Greeks to our community, to Rust, to seek out the black professional and bourgeoisie Negroes, <laughs> to lure them away because these bushes don't have a sense of commitment to their own people and their own institutions. And then they give the image as though we have made progress because all they have given black people is symbols, holidays, images, and totals. Let me say it again, because you won't forget that. Symbols, holidays, images, and tokens. You won't forget if you spell it out as an acronym. <laughs> Symbols, holidays, images, and tokens. Symbols, holidays. You're going to wake up and think about it in a minute. Symbols, holidays, images, and tokens. Symbols! Images and tokens. Now, you know what a symbol is? You get played. A symbol is when they say, we're going to put Harry Tubman on a $20 bill. That does not put money in your pocket. Holidays, Juneteenth, you still broke. Images, multiracialism. Uh, on television, but you're still broke. Tokens, where they put black people in positions in white space, positions
positions, without power and status, without strength. Nothing's going to fix us but when they cut the check. Amen. And pay us our, amen, reparations. So, you see, here it is. They're luring Jesus and many of us get lured away from our HBCUs. Uh, but in spite of it, watch what we're doing. Watch what Russ, Co Co what Russ College is doing. Watch what has happened. We, we, we as HBCUs, we reach those who have been mislabeled unreachable. We teach those who've been mislabeled unteachable. We nurture those who have been mislabeled incorrigible. We redeem those who've been mislabeled irredeemable. HBCUs raise black kids' expectations because you will never experience what you don't expect. So we're 3% of the colleges, but yet we graduate 25% of all black kids with a college degree, 50% of all black teachers and public school personnel still come from 3% of the colleges in America, HBCU. We produce 85% of the judges, 60% of the doctors, some 50% of all blacks who graduate in STEM, they come from 3% of the colleges, and that is HBCU. And we help build black kids up. When this president shakes your hand, if you only have a high school diploma, your average earnings, wage earnings across your lifetime is a million dollars. If you get a college degree from Rush, it goes up to 2.4 million. So that means that when a student crosses the stage to get their diploma and the president shakes their hand, it is literally a million dollar handshake. And that is why whenever we have commencement, I tell the students to stand up and get their diploma and shake my hand so they can get their million dollar handshake. And that's what takes place at Russ. That's what takes place at these colleges. Well, Jesus had every reason to leave. These Greeks come, they were looking good, they shine, look like Greeks. They got great buildings, great coliseums, great libraries. These Jews don't have nothing. They got buildings that need repair. They got buildings across the street from us, I mean from that need repair. Uh, he had every reason to leave. I mean, think about it. He, 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 he'll be a tenured professor. He, there's a library, he'll, he'll be able to write, he'll have academic freedom. He had, and more importantly, if he goes, no crucifixion. He may live to be 85 or 90 instead of dying at 33. He has a decision to make because the cross is looming and these Greeks are saying, sign on the dotted line. But when those Greeks go back to Athens, they go without Jesus. Yes, sir. Jesus does not go with them, and yes, he uses what I told you is my greatest metaphor. Yes, Jesus says, if a seed yes, is put in the ground, yes, sir. except it be put in the ground, yes, sir. Uh, it will not produce anything unless it dies. Yes, but if it dies, it will produce a great harvest. In other words, every farmer knows that when he looks at that seed in his hand, like your life, every farmer knows I got three things I can do with this seed. I can consume it, and that's what you can do. You can spend the rest of your life consuming it on you. Or you can conserve it. I'm just going to wait, put it aside. Or here's the third C word. Contribute it. I can take this seed out of my hand and give it to the dirt, to the soil. But only one problem is I give my seed to the soil, that seed will die when it's buried. But something happens. It gets watered by autumn's 
rain. It gets warmed by uh, the sun of the summer. It gets energized by the nutrients that are in the soil. And after a while, a stalk emerges that produces 30, 40, and 100 more grain. What Jesus is saying is this, is that the only way my community is going to be best, blessed, is I've got to be willing to die to personal interests. That's right. I've got to be willing to give up my career and my aspirations. It'd be in my best interest to go to Athens, but it's in the best interest of my people right. if I stay here in Jerusalem. And you see, my brothers, and my sisters, you remember when he was on the cross, they said to Jesus, they said, look at him, ha ha, he has saved others, but he cannot save himself. That was meant as a jest. But it is true, even if they meant it as a jest, it is true. Those who want to save others can never save themselves. Listen to me. Sometimes when we talk about the cross, Many of you get intimidated to talk about the cross because it sounds so churchy. It's not a churchy concept. It is a life concept. In order for something to live, somebody and something must be willing to die. Prove it. When you eat your salad, please know that something died so that you could live. Those cucumbers, the lettuce, the tomatoes, they were living. The eggs could have become a chick, but it died. And you don't even say thank you, Sammy. some flowers to your wife or your girlfriend. Please know that the flowers were living, but they had to die to help your romance because nothing gets blessed unless something dies. So every time you eat a piece of chicken, a chicken dies. Every time you eat a hamburger, a cow died. Everything that is living is only living because something died. Every time you polish your furniture, it's because a tree died. Y'all not hearing me. Uh, the sun is dying. As it gives out hydrogen to keep us warm, the sun is dying. The cats, the cat was in the house. The mice said, what are we going to do with this cat? We can't go nowhere because this cat is in the way. One of the mice said, let's put a bell on the cat's tail so that every time the cat comes, the bell will ring and alert us so we can get out of the way. The other mice said, that's a good idea. Only one problem. Who's going to put the bell <laughs> on Chet's tail? Somebody got to be willing. Like Jesus. Yeah. And you'll say, no, unless.
unless a seed dies, there will be no growth. And the reason you ought to do it is because somebody did it for you. You're not here by yourself. You didn't make it on your own. The reason we're here right now is because someone decided not to go to Athens, but they decided that they would go to Calvary. They decided that they would pay the price. Now folk will laugh at you, and folk will think you crazy. A former mayor coming from Queens to Mississippi to be at Rust when with her credentials, she could be anywhere. She could be at Athens. But somebody has got to be willing to put a bail on the cat's tail. But listen to me. Even when you're crucified, you can't tell when it's a good day or a bad day until all your days come in. Because there was a man who had a horse and a son. And the horse ran away. And the neighbor said, it's a bad day because you lost your horse for plowing. And the man said, how do you know it's a bad day? Because my days have not all come in yet. Because the next day, the horse came back. But he brought back some wild horses. And now he's a rancher. And the neighbor said, it's a good day. It's a good day. All my days have not come in yet. Because the next day, the horse threw him off, broke his leg, couldn't work on the farm. The neighbor said, it's a bad day because of what happened to your son. But the man smiled and said, how do you know it's a bad day? All my days are not in yet. Because the next day, his nation declared war on another nation. The drag board tried to recruit his son. But because he had a broken leg, he could not be recruited. What looked like a bad day when the horse left. What looked like a bad day. Because you can't tell when it's a bad day until all your days come in and look like a bad day when Jesus didn't go into grief. It looked like a bad day when they took him to Pilate. It looked like a bad day when they said crucify him. It looked like a bad day when they marched him down the Via Della Rosa. It looked like a bad day when he hung on the cross and it looked like a bad day. But guess what? All his days were not in yet. That was Friday. But early, Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. Don't be lured. Don't be lured to Athens. Bless your folk. Stay with your folk. Help your folk. Give back to your folk. Advocate for your folk. Speak for your folk. Help your folk. Don't forget where you came from. Cosby, another big thing. Awesome, awesome. As James Brown would say, brother, you bad. You bad. 
many got sold? Well, we're getting to part dinner time. So dinner is getting ready to be served, and we will have some beautiful dinner music by Miss Shirley Cook, Russ College class of 1966. <laughs> While we're having a music by Ms. Cook, we're going to begin uh, to serve our food. I like for table one, two, three, and four. If you would stand and the table that's close to the wall, you'll be served at that table. So if you'll, at this point, the floor is thin out. Air table will be served first.
What year you graduated? I graduated in 2009. <laughs> 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 so they do this every day.
So this time we're going to begin to serve the first, second, and third table. We're going to ask that you go to your far right. Four, five, and six. We'd like for you to go to the table at your left over here. We can begin at this time. We have two lines to serve.
table number seven. If you'll go to the table closest to the wall. Table number seven. Number eight. And number nine. You'll go to the table that is closest to the wall. Seven, eight, and nine, if you'll stay in the line for the table that is closest to the wall. If you, if you all would stay in the line that's over against the wall, please. Jeff, if you keep that line to stay that's closer to the wall. Ten, eleven, and twelve. If you're getting into the line that is on the left hand side where Reverend Gladney is.
as you continue your meal. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you that I'm so proud I had a part of my days at college. Being a part of the world of famous a cappella choir under Lassie Holmes. Such a privilege. Continue to enjoy the dinner and the music. Ladies and gentlemen, under the direction of Dr. Alandra Harvey, please welcome the world famous Russ College a cappella choir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me answer one question that is probably on your minds right now. The world renowned Russ College a cappella choir is not an all-female ensemble. <laughs> However, the pandemic affects us all. Uh, but I do have two very active young men with me. These two fellas standing to my right, they are very active members of this ensemble. But I prayed to the Lord and told them the things I wanted. And you told me I already sent them, you just not using them right now. <laughs> Realizing that my two fellas, although outnumbered by the women of the group, they're both mass communication majors. Wow. I needed a videographer and I needed a photographer. Yeah. So they're serving double duty tonight. I'll announce the songs in two song sets. The second of the set is when I'll let you know about the rhythm section. That's what I call the fun set. It's the set that was that made it on the program because of my and stop. The first two selections are Hear My Prayer by Moses Hogan and Thy Will Thy Way by We don't remember. <laughs> uh, see you, Joe. R.J. Stevens.
The next two selections are in order Over the Rainbow and The Lion King Baby. These, both of these songs, like I say, they excite the kids. I told Miss Acapella, the reason I Miss Acapella, she's also one of the assistant conductors. What I wanted last spring, and that I wanted her to write it. And indeed. So, tonight, she's actually going to switch places. She's going to conduct over the rainbow. And while she's pretending to be me, I'm going to step back and sing with the rest of the world.
joined by my colleague, Mr. Byron, that and director, and the rhythm section. Ha ha! 
two selections this evening for us are a traditional piece entitled Hold On and I'll leave you in the world.
recognition donors and special guests, I'd like to bring up, and before I bring him up, I just want to say to you, Clarence here. Clarence helped me a lot. When I say helped me, I taught for seven years at Russ College in the Mass Communications Department. And Clarence would make sure that I had my grades in. <laughs> he made sure I had my classes right. And he made sure I got paid. <laughs> I love you, brother, brother. <laughs> my brother, Clarence Smith. All right.
children to graduate from Rutgers. At this time, we want to ask Dr. Cosby if he would stand. He blessed us tonight. He blessed us tonight, amen? We'd like to show you my own way how we appreciate what he has done. I would like for all of the officers and Russ Dyson, all of our officers and Russ graduates. Our purpose was to raise the money for it.
Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Well, my heart is full, and my stomach and my pockets with this check, too. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just overwhelmed by the, um, the, the reception that I've received, really, since I've been in Mississippi, and by the overwhelming support uh, from the Bearcat family, all the Russ College alums. I know the hour is late, so I'll be really brief. Really, the main thing I want to say is thank you. We're really grateful. We need these dollars and this support at Russ College so that we can continue to provide a wonderful transformational experience for young people who are looking for the opportunity to explore their dreams and receive the uh, training and platform and trajectory for the rest of their lives. And we know we can turn on the news every night and see all the many challenges that are going on in the world around us that especially affect our communities and the need for a strong leadership and for our young people to be educated, to get out here and make a difference and to improve um, our communities. So I'm very grateful to everyone that helped to organize this event to the Tupelo Lee County uh, Russ College Alumni Club and to all the churches that were involved. Thank you to our host church today here as well. A special thank you to Reverend Clarence Smith, who I'm told is known as Mr. Russ in these parts. <laughs> so, um, and I'm really proud of our students in the choir. Why don't you give them just one more? <laughs> I hope that 
they had the opportunity to meet so many of you distinguished alumni that are here in the audience so they could see what the future looks like for them. Well, we certainly have a fierce urgency about the mission that we have at Rust College of equipping and inspiring students for excellence and service in their communities and around the world. We need continued financial support, but we also need a continued pipeline of students. So please help to spread the word about the opportunities that are available in Rust College. We are meeting the challenges of the 21st century through improving our facilities, expanding our curriculum, and embracing technology. So while we're remaining true to all those um, values and traditions that many of you remember about Rust College, embodied by that song um, that the choir sang at the very end, um, I, you know, we are also determining how we can meet the expectations of modern 21st century students. So it's a balancing act and we need the support to be able to do that. So I wanted to briefly just mention that we have some summer programs at Rust. So for those uh, high school folks that are still in the room, we have, a, and also for the clergy that are in the room, we have a program called the Youth Theology Institute for rising uh, high school juniors and seniors. They get to stay on campus for 10 days and learn about um, their potential vocation and how the Lord may be shaping their lives and futures. So please contact Reverend Cepeda Thomas, who is our Rust College chaplain, or any of us at Rust College if you have a rising junior or senior who may be interested in staying on campus at Rust for about 10 days so they could get a taste of the college experience. We also have a variety of other summer camps. Some of them relate to basketball, some to broadcast, some to the arts. So please stay tuned for more information and help spread the word. If you're affiliated with a church or a school where you'd like us to come and share um, from our admissions team, please just extend an invitation. We're just up the road and we would love to come back and share a little more. I'm just so proud of everyone that's in this room because just the spirit that you bring, your uh, excitement, your vigor, and your enthusiasm about Rust College is contagious. And I have to admit to Reverend Cosby, uh, yeah, I was lured, I was lured. But it was ignorance because I grew up in Queens and I didn't know anything about, uh, about HBCUs. And so I want to be a part of spreading the word about the extraordinary education uh, and preparation that our students receive. I don't have enough time to tell you about, you know, some of the things that I missed out on by being, you know, in, in Athens. Yes, by being in Athens. <laughs> but I've come home now. And, and I just feel blessed to, to have the opportunity to serve in this venue. So let's just make sure there was nothing I, oh, I forgot to remind you to, uh, you want to show your Bearcat pride. We, we may not be able to afford a billboard in Tupelo right now, but each one of you can be a walking billboard by getting your new Rust College t-shirt. I hope you saw the shirts out in the lobby. We have a wonderful bookstore on campus that we just opened over Founders Week. So when you come to the campus, that will be another opportunity. And we're looking to have that online in the near future. So thank you again, everyone, um, and keep us in your prayers. Of course, you know we had a big threat this week. Uh, we were we had a bomb threat. Actually, it was last week, as many of our other HBCUs did as well. So uh, that just, again, underscores the urgency of our mission because there are people out here who feel threatened by the fact that we are producing the next generation of HBCUs. together uh, to serve our young people. Thank you again so much, everyone. Thank you.
to get this done. And the bad thing about it is that we good. She doesn't want any faith. But we are going to bless her tremendously because she has blessed us tonight. <laughs> As we get ready to close this evening, we'll bring up for closing remarks the Reverend Dr. Jeffrey A. Gladney, Chairperson of the Event Committee. Dr. Reverend Gladney. We're, we're going to be very brief. Amen. Let's give our MC another big hand. That was a program, man. <laughs>